Who says the theme is Beyonce? How about a little bit of Beastie Boys? Woo! Now, um, I have an association to that song, and, and yeah, we need to take the time now because I have to. I'm a science fiction fan, you know? And there's an association going back to that song to 1964, 1966. Does it ring a bell already? 1966, uh, Gene Rodenberry, Star Trek. Uh, that was when the screen show was first screened on NBC. And it came out as a show which had the first diverse cast on TV, which was revolutionary back then, as we were talking about diversity and inclusion. And since then, it has been promoting themes of diversity, of inclusion, of humanity. Um, it has been promoting the idea of, of pushing mankind uh, beyond the known limits of, of what we know. It has been promoting the idea of an ideal United Nations, the, uh, uh, the federation of, of the planets, basically, that try to solve problems not by war, but actually by working collaboratively to solve big problems. And looking at current times and where we are and uh, what's happening around the globe of uh, national small-mindedness, I think it's uh, time that we need more Trekkies. Don't you think so as well? And uh, following my, my association, Star Trek, I think we started with Star Trek. Star Trek, um, James T. Kirk, Spock, uh, Uhara, um, Yuhura, um, uh, um, um, Bones, um, uh, Scotty, you know, these were the, the uh, heroes of my childhood. Um, I was really amazed how they were rushing through uh, these adventure, uh, uh, adventures, um, racing through space, meeting uh, new unknown species and artifacts, and they had all this cool technology and all this stuff that, that was really outrageous. And I really loved the show back then. So I was ex particularly excited when in 2009, um, the new Star Trek movie came out, Star Trek. It was uh, kind of using time warp storytelling to get us all back to the young, original Star Trek crew. You've all seen the movie, have you? And, and uh, it was really cool because this was this young Kirk, I mean, this kind of uh, revolting guy, wild, and he was with his crew. They were kicking ass of some space villains, and, and they were kind of breaking some rules and, and breaking federal... A prime directive and, and uh, kind of disrupting some tools or spaceships uh, to get uh, cool things done. That was really outrageous. And, and this song, actually, um, it relates to these movies. There was the Star Trek movie in 2009, and there was uh, Star Trek Beyond this year, where they played this song as well. You remember where they played it? There's two scenes in the movie. One is in the Star Trek movie from 2009, and there's the 10-year-old James T. Kirk who uh, drives in the Mustang, uh, a Mustang, a vintage car uh, in a science fiction movie, of course, that he stole from his stepfather, and he wrecks the car in Grand Canyon, very disruptive to his father's uh, budget. And uh, the other one was uh, when the Star Trek crew in Star Trek Beyond finally um, uh, tries to protect the federal um, uh, base station or star base out there in space from this swarm attack of, of robots. Um, and they use this song to inject it as a virus into the, uh, uh, into the grid of those uh, swarm robots. Um, so these were two uh, disruptive things. Um, so that was just the connection I wanted to make to that song. Uh, you have to forgive me, I'm German. Sometimes it's complicated. Coming back. So now... <laughs> Now, okay, now we have to hurry up, um, but I have 15 minutes left. <laughs> I, oh, it took its time. Um, disruption. Disruption. I'll, I'll make that short. You know all the story. Is digital economy real? Is it? Yes or no? Uh, I think we all agree, yes, it's real. Digital economy is real. It's happening. It's changing the world. If you compare the five most valued at stock market valued companies in 2000 and let's say 2011 um, compared to today. In 2011, there were three companies that were kind of uh, typical uh, uh, non-IT companies. Uh, and, and there were kind of, uh, there's, uh, of course, at the top there was, uh, Apple was there. Um, but then there's ExxonMobil, there's uh, BHP, Billiton, um, there's uh, PetroChina, 
Um, and uh, um, uh, who, who was the third one? Uh, uh, I, I believe Amazon was already showing up there. Last year, different, different view. Those classical companies are gone. It's Apple, it's Microsoft, it's Amazon, it's Facebook. These are the companies who show up now as the most valued companies. Startups, Uber, um, uh, Airbnb, Facebook, you've heard it all. These companies weren't existing on the roadmap 10 years ago to a large extent, right? Meanwhile, they are valued in the billions. Airbnb, Uber, more than 20 to 30 billion. Facebook, 130 billion. These companies are going into industries all over the place and they disrupt uh, companies who have established businesses. Companies 50 years old, 100 years old, and these companies start wondering, what should we do about it? We need to do something about it. You can't just sit and wait until you get wiped out. So you need to get going. You need to do something. And um, that's why they are thinking how they can change their business. Can they change business models? As, for example, you move from B2B into a business to consumer business. Can they change from selling products to selling services? Instead of selling drilling machines, sell holes drilled into a wall. So they're starting to think how to change their business. And that's what sometimes is referred to as digital transformation, right? The term we can't stand anymore. Now, we, SAP, have gone through that as well. Sometimes we think of ourselves, hey, we're an IT company, we're doing software, we're doing all that crazy stuff. But quite frankly, we ourselves have gone through digital transformation as well. This is SAP as you knew it probably. SAP, what is SAP? It's an ERP company, right? Yep, hands up, ERP company. That's how we know SAP. Now. We had delivery cycles 10 years ago where we had a release every two years, you know, a big release coming out and then customers, it took them sometimes five years to get it implemented, no, to have it kind of deployed and implemented and active and used by everybody. And the time a developer saw between releasing code here and having it deployed there took decades. I mean, it took really, really, really long. We were selling software upfront, big upfront license revenue. Uh, big deals where the sales force going out for, for big deals. Now we've changed, we've massively changed. Um, that's our own transformation that we went through because now, this is the SAP you need to know, now we're down to being a cloud company and delivering in quarterly release cycles. We're releasing updates to the software we have in the cloud, functional improvements every two weeks on a global scale. We've moved from upfront license to subscription and pay-per-use models. And while it sounds very simple, for an 80,000 people company, it's a major undertaking to make that change. And it's not necessarily technology, as we've heard, but it's people who make it different and difficult to change and to change in that way and go through that change. And it has gone through all of the organization from uh, marketing to sales, uh, to development, to support, um, legal commercial, so the whole company had to basically change, but we went through that successfully, and we're still on that journey, and it means we need to stay agile and move on. So it's not just sometimes the brick and mortar companies you might be thinking of, but also in the IT industry, it's a topic that keeps us awake at night. So we have our experience with that. And it's also what we hear and what I hear whenever I talk to customers. And uh, if you talk and reach out to their IT departments and their CIOs, or you talk to the line of business heads in, uh, in HR or finance, um, they basically all go through these kind of considerations. How can we change our company and how we operate? We need to be faster. We need to change the way we do business. And Gartner has coined a term around that, which is uh, bimodal IT or two-speed IT, and Kinsey has a term for that, and IDC has a term for that, and you've all heard that. But it basically goes back to the problem that IT departments are seeing today, which is somewhat a split brain that they need to have. On the one hand, uh, they need to protect the core investments that they have. They need to protect the systems they have up and running and that keep their core applications and processes um, uh, up and running um, day and night uh, and running the whole core business. Um, and that's typically where SAP is known. That's where our ERP system is used by 300,000 customers around the globe, where we're in, in more than uh, 14 industries, uh, from insurance to retail uh, to gas and oil uh, and insurance and, and public sector. Um, but that's only one part of what they need to do. This is where they need to be very predictive, where governance is necessary, where compliance is important because you want to keep your CFO out of jail, right? But then they need to change. 
they need to change. They know they now reach, need to reach out to uh, consumers, for example. They need to digitize their business model. Um, they need to be um, more visible out there on the street selling products directly to end consumers rather than being in a B2B business. Nestle is a nice example. I mean, we're all we're using Nestle products and buying them off the shelf in a supermarket, but seldomly you turn it around and try to figure out is this a Nestle product or not. But now you buy Nespresso coffee capsules somewhere in uh, downtown in the city centers, and all of a sudden Nestle moved from being a B2B company into moving a B2C company, and all of a sudden customer experience becomes of utmost importance, right? It's a different way that you expect that you can engage with a, custom, uh, with a, with a company. And this mode where customer experience and an innovation culture is super important requires a different working mode in IT departments. It's not about preserving what you have and not exposing it to any risk, but this is about agility. This is about moving fast. This is about changing things quickly, testing it out, validating it with your end users, your consumers, fixing it, adapting it until it works exactly the right way, and then, boom, you want to scale it as quickly as possible around the globe. This is this mode two world. Um, this is where experimentation is much more important. And this is where companies differentiate typically. It's where you don't want the standard process. You don't want to have just the standard customer experience that your competitor might have, but this is where you differentiate, where you try to be special. This is where you build, as a company, your own solution because that makes you different and that makes you more competitive. That's this mode two world. But interestingly, this mode two world where you reach out into uh, social networks for consumer sentiment, where you do f um, um, front office things like marketing and sales, your, your shop front ends, where you start injecting IoT data um, into your platform to be more intelligent about what's happening to the machines that you have delivered to your end customers. Um, this is a world that does not live as an island. It's not living in isolation, right? It's just collecting sensor data is interesting and you can monitor and you can start trying to predict what's happening based on uh, time series data of your, of your sensor data. But quite frankly, what do you do then? What if it goes out of bound? What if it uh, hits certain thresholds um, that should ring an alarm bell? How do you feed that back into your core system where you understand that this, needs a, this machine needs service and you want to trigger a, uh, a service transaction where you want to engage with a business partner who provides those services to the end customer. How do you figure out who that customer actually is that bought the machine that is now uh, kind of creating an issue? Are there upsell opportunities? Can you provide better um, support uh, contracts for that customer? Can somebody call that customer, please? So there's always a link between the new scenarios, the innovation scenarios on one hand side, and the core processes of those companies. And you need to create that link in a secure and controlled fashion. So that's the problem to solve. Now for the agility part, where you start ideation early on and time to market is of essence, and where you then want to quickly innovate um, to come up with a minimum viable product and move on, um, we figured that Cloud Foundry is actually the ideal basis to realize that environment. This is a platform which allows you to uh, bring in your own programming languages of your preference, where you have open source as um, providing the necessary speed and innovation that's driving the platform and your capabilities on top forward. This is a platform where DevOps was considered right from the start, which allows you to get away from classical IT implementation cycles, long um, kind of back and forth between development and IT operation operating this solution. IAS neutral, so you can choose where to run the solution, whether it's with one of the hypercloud providers or in your own data centers and your own IT. A solution built from ground up with microservices in mind that allow you to build those agile microservices to plug together and change individually um, without bringing the whole system down and uh, slowing you down. So this is where actually we thought that Cloud Foundry is absolutely essential for our customers um, to get into that agile mode. So we've started engaging with Cloud Foundry early on. Um, it was a, uh, well, it wasn't first uh, love at first sight. Uh, actually, we, we started early in 2011 looking at uh, Cloud Foundry uh, early on um, due to some IP and, and uh, uh, license-related issues. We didn't engage with it uh, fully, so uh, uh, that, that uh, initial love uh, faded away um, for a short moment. It was a little bit of one of these uh, on-off uh, on things, like with uh, Uhura and Spock in the 
uh, Star Trek uh, Into Darkness movie or, um, or uh, uh, Han Solo, different uh, universe, Han Solo and uh, Princess Zaya. We've seen what can come out of this. Um, but then, when the foundation idea was actually created, we were coming back uh, together. Um, SAP, when we were approached, uh, immediately jumped on this because we thought this is a great thing that's happening uh, in the community. We became a, a platinum sponsor, um, are on the uh, um, um, Cloud Foundry board, of course. Um, we have quickly become SAP Cloud, um, uh, Cloud Foundry certified with the SAP Cloud Platform in 2015. And the last story continues. Um, we uh, we uh, opened a, a dojo lab in uh, Germany, um, so we're part of uh, spreading the news and making uh, sure we get uh, additional black belts uh, on board quickly. And we just recently um, uh, released uh, uh, Siemens MindSphere, uh, that's uh, the uh, IoT cloud um, of uh, Siemens, um, uh, on top of SAP Cloud Platform, Cloud Foundry as the first uh, product, um, and now we have a GA release uh, of Cloud Foundry out there in the market, and I have more about this. Now, we're expecting, let's see what comes out of this. Uh, we, we're still trying to figure out who is who, who is Cloud Foundry, who is SAP, and maybe we get some hints afterwards. So, now what are we doing? We're, we're contributing a lot, so most of the improvements we've made uh, in, in the platform itself, in Cloud Foundry itself, we contributed back as good uh, open source members, so we're, we're very, very active here. We're currently doubling the number of full-time committers we have. As I mentioned already, we believe it's important to spread the news and get more experts into Cloud Foundry, um, so we opened the, uh, the dojo um, in Germany. Um, and we're a big contributor to a number of projects here. We're leading some of them, so we're together with SUSE, we're running the uh, uh, Bosch OpenStack CPI. Um, our latest contribution now is the service fabric to also make it easier to um, uh, run instantiation of uh, backing services uh, in this environment because, of course, it's um, in the end you need to get something up and running which is bigger than what Cloud Foundry covers. Um, working together on uh, topics uh, we, like the uh, app uh, autoscaler, uh, very important, of course, uh, in uh, large-scale environments. And the app Autosleep, quite frankly, is also uh, equally important because uh, everything that's up and running and deployed creates cost because you need infrastructure underneath. And for a um, service provider, this is, of course, something you want to minimize. So we need to also be able to uh, hibernate uh, certain services again. So we're um, working here and contributing to a large extent. But now, agility, um, as we talked about it um, earlier, is only part of the, of the equation. So what we need to look into is what's happening at those customers, and that's where um, it becomes interesting. Digitalization means every company becomes a software-driven company by intelligently connecting people, things, and businesses. And now you need three minutes to read that sentence and think about it again. Um, I hated it in the beginning because I thought it's so untechy, but it's a great sentence to describe what digitalization is about and what it takes. Um, because what it takes is all these things that are underneath. You can't be intelligent if there, if there is no real-time data in your platform. If there is no real-time analytics on top of it and it takes you two weeks to come up with an answer to a question, uh, that's not very intelligent. With more and more machine data, you need machine learning on the platform. Otherwise, who's making up what's going on in those data time sequences, right? Connecting means security in the end. You need to see how all of that doesn't live in isolation, but links left and right into your existing legacy systems, into your other cloud SaaS solutions that you're living with. How do you integrate that? It's about people, user experience, customer experience, collaboration, mobile. All these services need to be part of what um, needs to be solved in digitalization um, projects. IoT, you have new business models, models right? If you go to pay-per-use, pay-per-use for a drilling machine, um, it's a different model that you need to support in your environment than selling the machine somewhere um, through Home Depot, right? Um, you work with new ecosystems, um, like Cloud Foundry itself creates an ecosystem of application developers. You need APIs and microservices. So it's a broad set of capabilities that you need. And that's what we're after. That's what uh, SAP is actually bringing to the table. We take Cloud Foundry as the core of our cloud offering um, as an open platform with all its benefit of a huge community that's driving it, of other commercial offerings that help drive an ecosystem and create more knowledgeable people about it that create demand for solutions in that space. Flexible runtimes because US developers have 
preferences, have choices. There's trends coming up, languages coming and going. Um, so you can't be static. You don't want to be too limited on that. And microservices as a basis of all of that. Then we put business services and capabilities on top of this. Things like machine learning services, things like IoT services to connect devices, manage devices. Um, the whole topic of analytics on top of the data. Big data itself that needs to be managed in such an environment. Think in-memory databases, um, think Hadoop, think Spark, um, think all the databases out of the open source community that in the end are managed and used together to uh, um, bring a solution to life. So that is much, much more um, than actually just your running application that you need to consider. This is the SAP Cloud Platform. And since our customers tell us it's important to them where that solution in the end runs, it was important to us to also support various infrastructure providers underneath to run those solutions. So what we're providing is SAP Cloud Platform not only in SAP data centers around the globe, but also on uh, AWS. Um, so we released that four weeks ago as a general available release. So you can run SAP Cloud Platform Cloud Foundry on top of Amazon. So we provide that out of the box. Um, we announced a beta, and we heard Microsoft talk about it earlier as well. Um, we announced that same solution on Microsoft Azure as a beta, and we announced the intent to do the same thing with Google Cloud Platform for the near future. Um, we're already working on that one, so we're pretty confident to give that to you um, pretty soon as well. Now, what we're doing here is not just multi-cloud in the sense of this is enabled to run everywhere, we run it as a managed service for you in those environments. So you can get rid of worrying about how to run the underlying Cloud Foundry infrastructure, how to run all those services that we're providing, but you get this basically as a service. So this is an enterprise um, platform as a service offering that we're bringing to the table here. On top, we have development tools um, that bring this uh, across uh, for, for all the services. Um, a, uh, uh, it's called SAP Build and Web IDE, which is our cloud-based development environment, um, tools and APIs, so everything is available and accessible via standard-based APIs. A central cockpit where all those services, the operations for service providers and developers alike is provided and a commerce and marketplace, which is super important because it allows an ecosystem of solution providers to also bring their solutions into our customer base. So if you are an ISV or you are a partner who wants to deliver solutions into these 14 industries or one of the 14 industries to one of those 300,000 customers, there's a marketplace, there is an app store, it's called App Center available, where you can bring in your uh, solution. Um, there's a commercial model behind it, so charging, billing, all of that is available, and automatic deployment of your solution into the platform for our customers. Marketplace, super important, and we believe that this is also something which um, is important for the Cloud Foundry community at large and um, uh, will help us create an ecosystem around it. So this is what we're doing here. Now, we use that to build new solutions. Our customers use that to build new solutions, um, to extend uh, the SAP application portfolio. So our ERP solutions are extended on this platform in microservices. And we use that to integrate new solutions on the platform with our core applications. So as I said before, it's never that any of those new innovative solutions you're building in that space are isolated or wouldn't link back into your core applications, your SaaS solutions, your on-premise ERP, your S4 HANA system from SAP. This is what the platform provides to you. And then it's very easy to extend one of those solutions. So if you happen to have an ERP backend somewhere within your company, and I think there's a number, there's a good probability that, that uh, many of you have that, it's an easy way uh, to connect out of our cloud, uh, any of the hypercloud provider infrastructures underneath into your core systems via this platform. This is the, the value we bring in. Now this picture, I will now explain in detail. No, I will not. <laughs> the, um, this was just put in to give me some technical credibility. I couldn't explain it. It should just tell you one story. First is you can print it out and you can use the backside to take notes. But it also tells you it's complicated. There's a lot of, I mean, what looks nice on a architecture picture, as you all know, if you've ever tried to build something on top of the platform or within the platform, there's many, many moving parts. And can you see this? This is gray hair. And you should see um, our team sitting here in the audience. Those are the guys with really gray hair. 
it's hard to get all of that integrated and enterprise graded um, and get that ready and up and running on all those infrastructures. So we know it's a lot of effort. So there's value in providing this as a service, as a managed service um, uh, to you in a public cloud environment. Um, that's just a caveat to not try to do these things uh, probably on your own. Now, I wanted to um, uh, take the opportunity here, uh, maybe I go back to show you what we are actually doing with that. What are we doing with those services? Maybe we can quickly play that movie uh, we have prepared. This is a product called SAP Brand Impact, and this shows how machine learning is actually applied in an enterprise context. Um, as you can see with these rectangles, what we're doing is we're using machine learning and training of algorithms to detect company logo, brand logos in uh, sports events. And uh, these brands are paying a lot of money to actually figure out um, for how many minutes uh, or seconds was my logo visible because they pay per second uh, that uh, a logo is visible during some of those events. And there's interns actually in the past who were kind of sitting there with stopwatches um, taking note of when is the logo of SAP or when is the logo of Cloud Foundry showing up in some of those uh, sports events on some side banners. Um, and we can detect that automatically and feed it back into our marketing solution automatically. And that's how we think about building new innovative solutions on top of the platform, leveraging machine learning algorithms, big data, um, linking that back into the solution. So that was just one example. Now, what I, I want to conclude with, and I'm already seven minutes over time, only attributed to my explanation of the, uh, of the Beastie Boys song. Um, what I want to conclude with, what I want you to, to take with you, is it's basically the following. SAP, we're totally committed to the Cloud Foundry community. This is super important to us because it's super important to our customers. Um, it's part of their strategy that we support them in their digital transformation, in all the innovation projects that they are currently doing. And they are happening in all the industries. In some of them, it's a hurricane that's currently going through. Ta think retail, think banking. In others, it's a storm um, or a very strong wind. Uh, maybe if you go down the B2B uh, direction and, and go uh, deeper into whatever gas and oil um, or, or public sector but it's coming in all those industries, and it's super important. And we believe that the challenges in those industries can only be overcome if we have a different way of thinking, a different culture, a more agile way of doing things. And a platform as a service offering, like SAP Cloud Platform, and Cloud Foundry as the underlying um, pass operating system, uh, as I would say, this is key, this is absolutely important to getting these problems solved. And then it takes you, it takes developers to get the magic done. Um, because we talk about differentiating in, uh, innovative solution. It's not about running the boring old stuff. It's about getting these fancy new things going, coming up with great ideas and what to build. And you want to do that in a quick fashion. And in the end, we all don't do this probably because we're altruistic and we think it's great technology, let's keep going. But in the end, there's business behind these things. So there's uh, the need for a commercial model. There's need for a partner ecosystem. Um, we need support. In the end, it's not about building everything individual, but building a huge application portfolio that you can deploy into many providers' cloud environments. That is why the diverse um, provider ecosystem of Cloud Foundry is also of utmost importance. And if we all collaborate together and work jointly together, we can create um, actually more for the industry than just the uh, sum of the individual pieces that we bring to the table, super important. Now, if you are now interested what, what SAP is doing in that space, um, I can recommend you to go to one of our 17 sessions we have scheduled here. So our experts are here on the ground, a great opportunity to network around machine learning, IoT, blockchain, big data, um, the platform itself, of course, how it fits together. And there's a fancy name which could only be coming from a German company, uh, which is Polyglot In-Memory Application. So if you've been wondering what's in there, this is where these things are actually happening. Um, I wish you a great uh, summit here. Um, a network, as Abby has said, uh, take the opportunity to talk to other experts, left and right, exchange experiences. It's a great opportunity. Uh, I love to be here at this event. And then we can hopefully, uh, hopefully all boldly see if push, uh, push what no one has ever see if pushed before. Thanks for listening. Talk to you.